Welcome back. Today we're going to start our discussions of uh, the ethics, moral philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Uh, Kant is the second great moral. Kant is the second great moral theory of the modern era. Um, actually, Kant is earlier than Mill. Uh, the reason we do utilitarianism first, frankly, is because it's much easier. It's a nice way to ease students into moral philosophy to get them thinking about the issue, about the sort of the big issues and questions. Um, <clears throat> and because uh, Kant's moral philosophy and Mill's moral philosophy are so uh, influential today, and in a sense represent uh, two poles of a single uh, modern worldview, uh, ethical worldview, it sort of it sort of harm, it sort of doesn't matter which one you do first. Um, and so I always elect to do the easier one first, just to ease students into the subject. Um, <clears throat> but Kant's moral philosophy represents the other great tradition in the modern West. Um, and I think it's, it's not at all an exaggeration to say that to this day, uh, Kantianism on the one hand and utilitarianism on the other are the two most prevalent, most influential uh, moral, uh, moral theories today. <clears throat> Um, like the utilitarians, Kant is trying to offer an account of the rightness and wrongness of actions, an account which will yield uh, moral principles and rules. And also like utilitarianism, um, Kant's moral philosophy <clears throat> embodies some of the core assumptions, uh, the core modern assumptions about human nature. Um, in a lot of ways, between the utilitarian and the Kantian, we really have almost all of the elements of the modern conception of human nature, and especially in Kant's case, uh, of the individual. <clears throat> and I will talk a little bit more about uh, utilitarianism's and Kantianism's uh, contribution to the modern conception of, of human nature and of the individual uh, when we start our discussions on political philosophy with which we will end this course. <clears throat> Suffice it to say for now, that um, um, uh, Kant's moral philosophy is, is really con complementary uh, to Mill's. Um, the, the two of them t together really sort of represent the entirety of the modern way of thinking about ethics, or at least the, 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 the vast bulk of the modern way of thinking about ethics. Um, but they are indeed complementary <clears throat> in that each of them is sort of an opposite and the other. Each fills a void that the other uh, leaves open. <clears throat> So, for example, where utilitarian is, utilitarianism is consequentialist, Kantianism is deontological. Where utilitarianism focuses on increasing human happiness and decreasing human misery, Kantianism is concerned almost entirely with the autonomy and integrity of the individual. Right, so, so utilitarianism is considered with the general good, with the, with the welfare of, of, of human beings as a whole. Kantianism focuses, is an ethic that focuses very much on the integrity and the autonomy of the free individual. <clears throat> in almost every respect, uh, where, where the one theory goes left, the other theory goes right, uh, where one is lacking, the other uh, is strong. And in that sense, what I like to tell students when I teach this in, in, in a live class is that really Kant and Mill each have one piece of the truth. Uh, the, the trouble is that they don't have the whole of the truth, and to the extent to which their theories are mutually incompatible, they can't really be combined to, to sort of, to sort of uh, complete the truth. <clears throat> it's, it's my view that um, the phenomenon that we call morality is a much more fragment, fragmented, heterogeneous phenomenon than, all, than any of these moral theories make out. These moral theories make out that that, that, that morality can be systematized in, 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 almost in a way like mathematics, that there can be a complete, unified, coherent, logically grounded theory of morality. And uh, I just, I just uh, <clears throat> tend not to, not to think that that's the case. And so whenever we encounter any of these great, great moral systems, uh, it always seems to me that, that they've got a piece of the truth, but that they're missing a, a great many other pieces. <clears throat> And there has actually been a thread within uh, ethical, uh, within moral philosophy over the uh, over the centuries. There has been a thread of sort of skepticism about uh, the very pr the very endeavor of moral philosophy, the very uh, the very practice of trying to of, of, of theorizing in a systematic way about morality. Um, <clears throat> one of the most famous critics of moral philosophy, uh, 
uh, of this type was uh, the philosopher H. A. Pritchard in the first part of the 20th century wrote a very important paper called uh, "Does Moral Philosophy Rest on a Mistake," in which there is some uh, in which in which a critique is levied against the very idea of systematic ethics of the kind that both Mill and and Kant are producing. Uh, and uh, if, if we were in a, in a course solely devoted to ethics, I would certainly flesh out those, those criticisms because, because in my view those criticisms are very powerful and uh, in my view as of yet there have not been satisfactory responses to them uh, uh, on behalf of ethical, uh, systematic ethical theory. But I will just have to leave it as a tantalizing, uh, <clears throat> as a tantalizing pos uh, cr possible line of critique for now. Let's just say a few things about Immanuel Kant by way of biography. Uh, Kant is the last major philosopher of the Enlightenment. After Kant, be, uh, we, we begin what's called Romanticism in philosophy. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean that there aren't any philosophers after Kant who might be considered Enlightenment thinkers. In many ways, I think that John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, uh, who come in the next generations, are Enlightenment thinkers. Um, but... Um, <clears throat> but uh, but Kant is really the last great Enlightenment philosopher. And um, it's sort of difficult to give a biography for Kant because so little of event actually happened in his life. He was a very, led a very sort of methodical, regular, uh, in, many ways, uh, in many ways predictable life. Of course, that doesn't apply to his philosophy, which is uh, truly remarkable. Um, he spent his entire working life as professor of logic and metaphysics at the University of Konigsberg. And what's interesting about Kant is, unlike some of the other philosophers we've read, like, for example, David Hume, who, whose first great work, I think, appeared when he was something like 26 years old, all of Kant's major works were written after he was 60. Um, he was, in this sense, I think, a late bloomer. Um, he's most famous for his work in three areas, epistemology and metaphysics, that's one, ethics, and aesthetics is the third. He had an enormous influence on the romanticism of the following century. Uh, that is, the, uh, there's a whole wave of philosophy that comes out of Kant that's ca often called uh, post-Kantian idealism, which is a romanticist, uh, romantic form of, of philosophy that, 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 that predominates in the generation after Kant into the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> and what's sort of ironic about this is that the core, the essence of Kant's philosophy, at least, it, at least one of the centers of Kant's philosophy um, has to do with this idea of the limits of philosophical inquiry, the idea that, and scientific inquiry, and indeed all forms of rational inquiry. Kant, if you think about the beginning of the Enlightenment as representing infinite promise, right? This idea that well, you know, uh, we're just on the cusp of of knowing everything there is to know about the universe, which is you know, not a surprising attitude when if you think about the fact that in the early parts of the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution had just hit, and people were still sort of sort of awed and impressed by. Uh, by, by, by the, the leaps in knowledge that were being made. <clears throat> and so it's not surprising that people who, at the beginning of the Enlightenment, people like Descartes and others uh, were sort of overly optimistic. But by the time you get to the end of the Enlightenment, people like Hume and now Kant, there is a kind of a sobriety that sets in, a realization that, um, that human knowledge has limits, that inquiry has limits, that there's a limit to what it is possible to know, and that philosophy in particular should not attempt to push beyond those limits uh, because the results are never good when one pushes beyond those limits. Um, Hume certainly talks a lot about this, which we've, we've discussed, and, and Kant's, uh, one whole part of Kantian philosophy is devoted to outlining these limits. So it's a little ironic that a romantic tradition of philosophy claims him as an heir, considering that one of the hallmarks of romanticism is a kind of limitless uh, speculation, especially sort of mystical and metaphysical speculation, all of which is the kind of stuff that Kant uh, would have despised, and indeed Kant publicly denounced one of uh, these so-called followers, uh, uh, the philosopher uh, Fichte. Um, Kant publicly denounced him in a letter, and sort of to the effect of saying, "Well, this guy may claim me as a, uh, as, a as a as a as an influence, but I, I certainly don't uh, see him as my progeny." So he had an enormous influence on the following century, uh, an influence that was somewhat ironic. Um, his influence has remained very strong in continental Europe, 
Uh, Kant has had much less influence in the English-speaking world, with one great exception, and that is his moral philosophy. His moral philosophy has been incredibly influential, but his epistemology and metaphysics and his aesthetic theories have been more, power, have been more influential on the continent of Europe than they have been in, the, in England, America, uh, Australia, and the other English-speaking nations. Um, Kant's most important works, uh, he's got a, a huge roster, and if you're interested, you know, just, I would suggest that any of these philosophers that we're talking about, if you're really interested, you just go Google them or look them up in Wikipedia or one of the, on the, one of the online sources, and you'll get a lot of interesting stuff. But I think that, that the, at least a number of works upon which there, there is consensus that they are amongst his greatest are The Critique of Pure Reason, The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, The Critique of Practical Reason, and The Critique of Judgment. <clears throat> and I'll just let me just say right now, Kant's work is vast, it's intricate, it's difficult, it's 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 paradigm shifting, and one can only deal with him inadequately in a class like this. And so I I like to think that you're going to get a glimpse of one tiny corner of Kantian philosophy, and more importantly, you're going to get a glimpse at one of two major modern ways of thinking about ethical theory. Um, but 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 by no means fool yourself into thinking you've been you've gotten an education in Kantian philosophy because uh, two days worth of lecture certainly is not enough to uh, be able to say that. Um, all right, let's get started with the details. Uh, Kant, just as, Mill, as Mill does, Kant's moral philosophy begins first with a sort of a discussion of, of value, with analysis and an investigation of what are the things that are of value, and specifically what is of intrinsic value. And Kant starts right off saying that the only thing of intrinsic value is a good will. He, he, indeed, I think he's, this is the very first, I believe this is the very... Yeah, the very first sentence of the ground of the groundwork, page seven, in your Kant. It is impossible to think of anything at all in the world, or indeed even beyond it, that could be considered good without limitation, except a good will. Which is saying a good will is the only thing that is unconditionally good, that is intrinsically good. Now, obviously, we haven't defined what the good will is yet, and I'm going to ask you to, to, to hold off one moment and just sort of have an intuitive sense of what he means. Why does he think this? Well, he's got a very interesting argument. He says, look, anything else that you might want to call good, whether it's a commodity, money, a character trait, courage, um, uh, fortune, right? long life, good health, or, large, or partly matters of fortune, anything that we might consider to be good, can be turned bad if attached to a bad will. Right, so think about the things I just mentioned. Money. Is money a good? Well, it's good if, it's, if a good person is making use of it. Right? Money in the hands of a bad person is not a good. Right? If anything, it's an evil. Right, we don't want rich tyrants. We don't want rich mass murderers. We don't want rich bad people, right? Because what are they going to do? They're going to, they're going to, they're going to use the bad, they're going to use their wealth uh, towards bad ends. Similarly, you take a character trait like courage. Is courage a good? Well, again, it's good and a good person. But you don't want a, cor a courageous uh, Nazi general, right? Because that means that he's going to succeed in advancing the dastardly causes uh, of his masters. Right, so even a character trait like courage, Kant wants to say, is only good if one presupposes that the will, who is the will behind the the courage, is a good will. And the same thing with fortune. Uh, it, it's great fortune if you're blessed with good genes and you're going to live to be a hundred. But again, if you're a bad person, nobody wants you to live to be a hundred. Right? They'd rather you die young and have you know, have, have heart failure. So, Kant says. Anything that we deem good, uh, its goodness is, is dependent upon there being a good will operating behind them. Uh, where, there's a, where the will is bad, none of these goods are good any longer. And let me just read the rest of that passage to see where he says this. He says, quote, Understanding, wit, judgment, and the like, 
Whatever such talents of mind may be called, or courage, resolution, and perseverance in one's plans as qualities of temperament, are undoubtedly good and desirable for many purposes, but they can also be extremely evil and harmful if the will which is to make use of these gifts of nature, and whose distinctive constitution is therefore called character, is not good. Power, riches, honor, even health and that complete well-being and satisfaction, which one calls happiness, produces boldness and thereby often arrogance as well unless a good will is present, which corrects the influence of these on the mind, and in so doing also corrects the whole principle of action and brings it into conformity with universal ends. Okay. So Kant thinks that the only thing that's intrinsically good, the only thing good in itself, the only thing unconditionally good is a good will, his main reason is that everything else, the good of everything else, the value of everything else depends upon uh, there being, it's being employed by a good will, uh, and the bad will has the power to turn any uh, potential good into an evil. Uh, we are also going to see, as we continue on uh, fill, fleshing out Kant's position, we're also going to see that for Kant, the development of the good will, the, the development of the moral character, uh, represents the pinnacle of human uh, fulfillment. And in this sense, Kant is very much like Aristotle. Uh, although Kant's conception of morality is very different from Aristotle's, there's going to be no talk about moderation, there's going to be no talk about you know, balancing desires and things like that. Indeed, Kant is going to be very much, is very much going to think, say that moral duty sort of pushes against, our, against desire, in opposition to desire. In the larger sense of the, this idea that the morally developed character or personality represents the ends of a human being, represents the, the, sort of the, 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 the pinnacle of human development f and thus constitutes human fulfillment and achievement, the, the, this the two, the two philosophers have very much in common. Um, and so uh, um, we want to keep an eye on that. Uh, especially because of the way that Kant thinks about the good, construes the good will, which is what I want to talk about now. So, so what exactly is a good will? Right, we've just been told it's the only intrinsic good. He's given us some interesting reasons for thinking about that, but he's, we still really haven't defined it. We're still working with, with only an intuitive sense of the concept. So what is a good will? Well, and I'm going to put it in a formula, which we'll then, which we'll then unpack. A good will, Kant thinks, is a free, rational will that acts from duty rather than desire. Right? So the good will is a free, rational will which acts from duty rather than desire. And we want to break this down into, into elements, this, this, this account into elements, and then we can discuss each of the elements. So for one thing, the good will represents the moral personality. Right? What a moral person is, is someone with a good will. He says the good will is always a free will. And so there's a, there's a connection here between the idea of freedom of morality on the one hand and the idea of, of freedom on the other. Kant thinks, and this is another sort of very interesting aspect of his philosophy, Kant thinks that it's only when we, follow, when we obey the moral law that we are actually free. Now this sounds somewhat paradoxical, but how can, how can you construe freedom as a matter of obedience? Um, uh, and this is sort of one of the most interesting aspects of, of Kant's philosophy. Kant really thinks that we are least free when we are most free. That is, when we, when we are unrestrained by the moral law is when we are the least free, Kant thinks. It's when we are voluntarily constrained by the moral law that we are most free. And this is something that we'll have to, we'll have to tease out as we, as we go along, and, and I promise you that we will. Uh, the third element of this, notice I said uh, a good will is a free rational will that acts from duty rather than desire. A third element of this is the idea that the demands of duty are the demands of reason. That the morally right thing to do is always the rational thing to do. And this is going to be an, also an important part of Kant's moral philosophy because when we finally get around to formulating Kant's supreme moral principle, uh, which is really sort of a test uh, for whether an action is right or wrong, the chief our attribute uh, that's going to be looked for in uh, our actions is a kind of consistency of principle, a logical consistency of principle. And this is the sense in which, uh, uh, this reflects the sense in which for Kant, the moral obligation is always, is always uh, a rule of reason. The laws of morality are laws of rationality.
they are laws that bound, bind all rational creatures. Okay, so let's now start discussing each of these elements uh, uh, separately. Let's talk about moral obligation and the goodwill. Right? This idea that one of the things that defines the goodwill is that it's, it's, it's a will that acts from duty. <clears throat> and, what, and what this all says about, about, about moral obligation and about us. Kant believes that it is, our, it is our capacity to recognize and freely choose to act upon the moral law that defines us as human beings. What it is to be a human being at its, at its, at its, fullest, in its fullest sense of the word right, is to be a creature that recognizes moral obligation and voluntarily chooses to act upon it. Um, so the autonomous individual, the free individual who follows the moral law in his own accord, this represents the pinnacle of human evolution. I'm putting that in scare quotes, of course. Human evolution for Kant. It represents uh, the human good for Kant in the Aristotelian sense of the human good. Kant thinks we are literally designed for morality. We are designed as duty followers, he thinks. We are not designed, Kant says, we are not designed for the pursuit of happiness. This is a fa fascinating point. So take happiness in the utilitarian sense, this idea, right? The hap happiness for the utilitarian is when one's desires have been satisfied, right? When one's desires have been satisfied and when one's pains and frustrations have been eliminated. That's happiness for, for, for the utilitarian. Kant says human beings are not designed for this, or at least not primarily for this. Kant is not denying that people are capable of being happy. What he says is, being happy does not constitute the fulfillment of human nature. It does not represent uh, the fulfillment of man's essence. We are designed for morality. We are not designed, at least not primarily, for the pursuit of happiness. Now, why on earth does Kant think this? His argument is interesting, though a bit... It goes a bit around in order to get to the point. Right? I'll try and summarize it as best as I can. Kant begins with the assumption that nature is supremely e efficient. In other words, he says, nature does not create anything whose chief characteristics are at odds with their functions. So for example, think about, let's, let's take an internal organ, take a heart, okay? A heart is designed in a certain way. It's got a certain number of essential attributes that, that, that comprise its form, its structure. Those essential characteristics are directly related to its function. Right? Indeed, it's because these are a heart's essential characteristics that this is its function. What, our what, what, what Kant wants to say is that this is a universal principle. See, I'm talking about functions. It makes me think of Aristotle. Kant thinks this is a universal principle of nature. That nature is always efficient. Nature does not create anything in such a way that it does not, that its chief attributes are not in harmony with its function. Now, given that general principle of nature, Kant says the following about human beings. The standout characteristic of a human being is his or her capacity for rational reflection and deliberation. And in this, Kant is, is, is just sounding the same horn as so many philosophers have sounded. Human beings are defined by their reason. What distinguishes us from the animals is reason. Okay? Right, so human beings are defined... So in talking along these, in this way about nature and about essential characteristics being tied uh, in an essential way to functions, the essential characteristic of a human being for, for Kant is the capacity for, for rational deliberation and reflection. So, so reason is the chief attribute of a human being, as designed by nature. Kant then goes, out to, goes on to observe the following. He says, reason as a faculty, as a capacity, is not very well suited to the pursuit of happiness. Okay? Right? The pursuit of happiness involves the satisfaction of desire, the elimination of pain and frustration. Right? What Kant is saying is, for those jobs, for the job of increasing happiness, increasing pleasure and reducing pain, reason is not well suited. Indeed, he says, the pursuit of happiness is much more efficiently accomplished by uninterrupted, unreflected upon instinct. Right? The best example of an efficient desire satisfier is an animal. 
an animal with a highly tuned set of instincts. Human reason, Kant says, gets in the way of the pursuit of happiness. Right? It's, when we re- it's when we deliberate and reflect that we consider what we desire, that we consider what it is we're going to do, what it is we ought to do. It's in deliberation and, and, and reasoning, it's in deliberation and reflection that we ask ourselves the question, ought I to do this? Should I do that? And this does not facilitate the pursuit of, desire, of, the pursuit of happiness. It, if anything, obstructs it. It gives us pause right? in the course of action we're considering. And I think if you reflect upon, just think about your own experience. I think this is, this is very true of, you, of, of, of people in general. Um, you're most likely to efficiently follow your desires when you don't think about it too much. Especially when the desires are leading, uh, the desires point you in, in bad directions. Um, think about it, when a person wants to do something, wants to pursue a desire that they know that they shouldn't, that they shouldn't pursue, the most efficient way to do it is to do something to turn your rationality off. So, for example, a person may get drunk. One of the things that being drunk, that, that drunkenness does, is it blunts the capacity to deliberate. It blunts, it blunts the, it blunts the rational mind. And so, I think that, that Kant is on to something in this, with this idea that reason is not a facilitator of, of, of desire. It's not a facilitator of happiness. If anything, it represents an obstruction. Right? Another layer of consideration, of decision, of, of deliberation, of contemplation that, that, that opens up the possibility that the, the, that the desire will not be pursued after all. Let's read what Kant says about this. Bottom of pages 8, uh, eight over to page 9. Um, and um, w- he begins by talking about this general principle that nature does not create anything with, with a chief characteristic that is not, that is not in harmony with that thing's ends. Um, and then he'll move on to the business about reason. Bottom of page 8, quote, In the natural constitution of an organized being, that is, one con- constituted purposefully for life, we assume as a principle that there will be found in it no instrument for some end other than what it is also most appropriate to that end and best adapted to it. Now, in a being that has reason and a will... If the proper end of nature were its preservation, its welfare, in a word, its happiness, then nature would have hit upon a very bad arrangement in selecting reason, the reason of the creature to carry out this purpose. For all the actions that the pre- creature has to perform for this purpose and the whole rule of his conduct would be marked out for it far more accurately by instinct. And that end would have thereby been attained much more surely than it ever can be by reason. So here he's just said, look... Nature doesn't make any creature with, any, with an essential characteristic that's not best suited to its function. Um, if the function of a human being is to be happy, then nature has designed a very poor instrument for it because we are creatures of reason, and reason is not a very good faculty for pers- the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness is most efficiently ac- accomplished by instinct. Okay. If you think about animals, they are desire satisfaction machines. Right, they have a high, set, high set, a honed set of instincts and, and automatic sort of lightning fast reflexes, and they and they just sort of they you know the desire comes up in an animal brain, and every aspect of that animal's being is directed towards satisfying. A human being, though, that that rational mind starts to think and to deliberate, and then that leads to worry, and that leads to reconsidering, and that leads and then. Right, the whole, the whole, the whole pursuit of happiness may be derailed. He continues on in the next paragraph. In fact, we find that the more a cultivated reason purposefully de- occupies itself with the enjoyment of life and with happiness, so much the further does one get away from true satisfaction. Right, this is just simply a variation on the argument that ignorance is bliss. He says, notice the smarter the person, the less happy they tend to be. And from this there arises in many, and indeed in those who have experimented most with this use of reason, if only they are keen enough to admit it, a certain degree of misology, that is, hatred of reason. So Kant thinks that, 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 that being, moral, being a moral being, bad English, being a moral being, uh, represents the fulfillment of human nature. <coughs> 
that we are designed for morality, not for the pursuit of happiness. And the reason he thinks this is because he thinks that our chief characteristic as human beings, this capacity for rational deliberation and reflection, is not suited to the pursuit of happiness. It is best suited to the identification of duty. The role that rational deliberation and reflection play, what, what Aristotle called practical reason, the role that practical reason plays is the identification of our duty in any state of, in any given state of affairs. It's reason that, 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 that identifies what we ought to do and distinguishes it from what we ought not to do. Okay, so we've discussed one element of the goodwill, and that is this idea that the goodwill is the moral will, the, the will that acts from duty rather than desire. And we've talked a little bit about the relationship between the goodwill and Kant's conception of human nature and this idea and his ideas of human fulfillment. Let's now focus on this this this, this notion acting from duty, right? We said the goodwill is the free rational will that acts from duty rather than desire. Let's, let's talk about this difference between acting from duty, uh, acting from desire, and, and we're going to tie it into the Kantian conception of freedom. Okay, first of all, the difference between acting from and acting in accordance with duty. We'll do the second first. When one, when one acts in accordance with duty on Kant's view, one does what duty requires, but not because it is one's duty, but in order to satisfy some other desire. In other words, when one acts in accordance with duty, one is not motivated to do P, where P is some action, because it's one's duty, but rather because P will produce a desirable outcome. So, I think I gave an example last time about a lady drowning in a lake. So imagine that, you know, I see a lady drowning in a pond, and certainly I have a moral duty to try and save her life if I can. And suppose that I do go ahead and try to save her life, and suppose I succeed. Um, con but, but suppose that the reason I did it was because I figured that if I saved this woman, I'd become a local celebrity, and if I became a local celebrity, it would increase uh, my business. So let's suppose I own a store. And I figured, well, if my name is in every newspaper and I'm sort of, you know, the, 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 the town Good Samaritan, then that will increase my business. Kant would say, I've acted in accordance with duty. I've done what duty requires. I've tried to save this woman's life. And yet I didn't do that because it's my duty. I did that for another reason. I did that in order to satisfy a desire. What desire? The desire to be famous and rich. So there I've acted in accordance with duty. No, so I haven't acted contrary to duty. I've, I haven't act, to act contrary to duty would be to not try to save the woman at all. I did try to save the woman, but I don't really care about her. I don't really care about the fact that I'm morally obligated. I, I just figured that if I save her, good things will come to me. Now, to act from duty is to do what duty requires because duty requires it. So, so to use the same example, Suppose in another instance, another person comes along, a person, a better, better person than I am, of course, and this person sees another, uh, another uh, uh, lady drowning in the lake. Right? This, is the, this is the lady eating lake. Right? And sees another woman drowning in the lake and, and, and dives in to save her and does it because, for no other reason than that she believes that it is her duty to save a drowning person if she can now this person has indeed acted from duty and not merely in accordance with it. Notice, the acting in accordance with versus acting from goes directly to the question of motivation. What is the motive for your action? Are you doing this because it is the right thing to do, because duty demands it, or are you doing it because doing it will, will satisfy some desire that you have, will, will, will produce some desired outcome? Kant discusses this distinction uh, on page 11. Let's look at the top of the page. It says, It certainly conforms with duty that a shopkeeper not overcharge an inexperienced customer. And where there is a good deal of trade, a prudent merchant does not 
overcharge, but keeps a fixed general price for everyone so that a child can buy from him as well as everyone else. People are thus served honestly. But this is not nearly enough for us to believe that the merchant acted in this way from duty and basic principles of honesty. His advantage required it. It cannot be assumed here that he had, besides an immediate inclination towards his customers, so as from love, as it were, to give no preference over another in the matter of price. Thus the action was done neither from duty nor from an immediate inclination, but merely for purposes of self-interest. So in this case of the shopkeeper, right, the shopkeeper has only acted in accordance with duty. Sure, duty requires that you not cheat your customers, but he didn't refrain from cheating because he thought it was his duty to do so, to, 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 to not cheat. He refrained from cheating because he figured that uh, it'd be better for business to keep things above board. That is, it's the desire for a successful business that's motivating him to, to do what duty demands. It's not that he thinks he ought to obey, do his duty, that is the primary motivation. Now you might think, well, who cares what his motivation is? Well, Kant cares. Because for Kant, only acting from duty has moral worth. I'll say that again. Only an action that is done from duty has moral worth. That doesn't mean that we might not be happy by the outcome, even if someone is acting in accordance with duty. It might not be that, it, it certainly may be the case that the, the outcome is desirable, is, is, is beneficial, that everyone is, benefits from it, but Kant thinks that this has no moral relevance whatsoever. That morally speaking, only the action that's done from duty has moral worth. Now, we, we want to ask, well, why does he think that? <coughs> and there are a number of reasons. And a big one has to do with freedom, with his Kant's idea of freedom. Kant thinks that it's only when we act from moral duty that we are acting in a truly free way. Here's one of the most sort of interesting and, and counterintuitive aspects of Kant's philosophy. I think today, when we use the word freedom, we tend to think of freedom as liberty from rules or liberty from authority. And so we think of freedom as our ability to do what we want. To put it in Kant's words, we think that we're most free when we are left to pursue our desires. But Kant doesn't see it this way. Because Kant sees the source of desire right, as in a sense being alien from the human will. Right? So to be left to act on one's desires, Kant thinks, is to be left to act under forces that are outside of one's control. In other words, you as a person cannot control what you desire or what you like. You can control what you do. Okay. But you can't control what it is you want, what it is you like, what it is that appeals to you. That is, in a sense, determined by nature. And so Kant really sort of literally thinks that when you act from desire, you are acting under a set of causes that do not originate from your own will. Right? They're causes that stem from, from, from the material side of your body. Right? They, 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 stem, they stem from, from uh, inclination, desire, uh, 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 taste, all these things that you don't have conscious control over. It's only when we act from duty in defiance of all desires that we completely control what we do. Because Kant thinks that when we act from duty, when the sole motivation of the will is the moral law, that there is no element of outside or external causality. There's no, there's no element of coercion. The moral law and the will that, that chooses to follow it stem, spring from the same self, the same conscious rationally deliberating self. And so Kant thinks that it's when we defy our desire and insist upon following the dictates that our own rationality has laid out. It's, remember, it's our own reason that identifies moral duty. Right? And reason is within the purview of the will for Kant. Right? 
unlike desire, which is outside of it. Kant thinks those are the only times that we are really acting autonomously. The only time that we are truly free is when we are completely liberated, not from duty, but from desire. And when we act solely upon uh, the result of the deliberations of our own wills. Now surely we must all see the kind of the dualistic implications here. Kant is not explicitly a dualist, although his position is sort of is sort of an odd one, and in my view, is in many ways dualistic. Um, but certainly, there's an element here of thinking that look, to act under certain influences is to be caused. In a material kind of sense of causality, right? That to act under the print, uh, under the 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 the. the, the the duties identified by our own conscious uh, mind, our own conscious uh, will, uh, that, that, that these are not, don't represent external causes, but are uh, a purely uh, internal, right? Are, represent internal causality, causality that springs from our own personality, from our own will. This certainly sounds very dualistic, and that's, I'm not necessarily saying that that's an objection. I'm just trying to sort of characterize the position so that it's more understandable. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the irony of the idea that one is most free when one is most consciously obedient. But remember um, that this irony disappears when we, real, when we think about the sources of causality, right? Um, when we are consciously obedient to the moral law, we are obedient to something that springs from our own rational will. When we are instead passively obedient to desire, we are obedient to something that lies outside of our will in our natural material constitution, in our guts, so to speak, over which we have no control whatsoever. And so that's why Kant thinks that the freedom enslavement lines up the way it does. And finally, um, uh, this again, re this represents a focus on motivation. Right, this distinction between acting from duty, acting in accordance with duty, this idea that, that we only act freely when, our, when, when we act on mor the moral obligations that are identified by our own wills. Um, th there, this represents, again, a focus on motivation that demonstrates the extent to which Kant believes that the moral value of an action doesn't lie in its consequences, but rather in the motivation and in the principle behind it. And this sort of intersection of motivation and principle, Kant is going to call a maxim. And we'll talk about this uh, more in the, ne in the next, in the next uh, lecture. So what I want you to think, what, want, what we're going to do next time is we're going, to, we're going to turn, we've talked about Kant's conception of the goodwill, we've talked a little bit about his idea of human freedom and autonomy and the relationship between uh, morality and the Kantian idea of freedom. Next time we're going to focus com fully upon Kant's account of moral duty. So we said that the good will is a free rational will that acts from duty rather than desire. We've analyzed all of those elements, but we haven't yet said what our moral duty is, what characterizes moral duty for Kant. And that's what we're going to do next time. So Kant's account of moral duty, and Kant is going to offer four examples, four, four ca ethical cases in order to show his theory in action. And we're going to talk about two of those four examples, but of course you're going to read all four. Here's a few things to think about while you're reading. First, can you explain in your own words why Kant thinks that the proper focus of moral attention should be on maxims rather than on outcomes? That's the first. And on a, a related question, what do you think of his reasoning in this area? Two, the second question, do you think that with respect to the four cases that Kant discusses, he has succeeded in showing that the moral wrongness involved is due to a failure of rationality? Do you think more generally that rightness and wrongness are matters of the rationality or irrationality of the agent? And this is a question, incidentally, that doesn't only apply to Kant, but to Aristotle as well, um, and to, to, to many Western uh, philosophies, uh, moral philosophies. Uh, there, is, there is an intimate relationship alleged between the capacity to reason and rationality on the one hand and uh, moral agency on the other, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing whether you see as close a connection between these two things as uh, Kant and, 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 and so many other philosophers do. So I will leave you with that, and we will pick this up again next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>